Great. Thanks so much, everyone, for sharing your information. Um, thanks again for being here this afternoon. My name is Ruthie, and I am Congressman Bowman's policy advisor. And I'm joined by uh, my colleague, Kama, who is uh, another member of the Congressman's office, and also Jan Fisher from Nonprofit Westchester for this webinar today. Um, before we get started on our presentation, the Congressman is on and has a few words to share with everyone. Um, so Congressman Bowman, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you. Hello, everyone. Peace and love to you all. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we've been working very hard to get a comprehensive understanding of how federal grants work throughout the country and how federal grants impact our district. So this is this is our honor to bring this information to you. And just wanted to let you know, this is a, the beginning of a larger conversation and an ongoing conversation to make sure you have all the information you need and then you, and so you can get to work on, you know, pursuing grants, writing grants, researching, researching grants and bringing resources into the district. I uh, just want to give you a couple of numbers. Um, the federal government provides over $750 billion in grants every year. That's $750 billion with a B. So there's a lot of money out there for us to pursue. Money in the areas of economic development, uh, things related to our youth, uh, violence reduction, flood mitigation, and any other category you can think of. Our district already brings in about $150 million uh, per year in federal grants. And we would like that number to, to double or even triple um, as we do this work. Um, so sit back, uh, relax, uh, enjoy the information. Please feel free to ask any questions uh, that you have. Ask a million questions. My team is ready uh, to answer all of those, qu those questions. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, collaboration is a very important part of this process. So it's not just about individuals or individual organizations uh, working to in pursuit of grants. It's about working together with uh, our office, other offices and other uh, community-based organizations to get it done. So uh, God bless you. Thank you for being with us and looking forward to beginning this journey with you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Congressman Bowman, for that. Um, so as the Congressman said, we have a, a full agenda today and plenty of room for questions. First, we'll go ahead and just go through, you know, what are federal grants? What are we talking about here? Um, and introduce you to the ways that our office and the ways that the Congressman himself can support your applications. Um, then we'll talk about how to access federal grants information, uh, federal grant information and be joined by nonprofit Westchester to provide some really important tips for grant seekers. Um, we're saving the last half of the webinar for questions. So definitely as we go through the material today, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box um, and we'll be happy to address them at the end. So first, who is eligible for federal grants? Uh, as the Congressman alluded to, there are 26 granting agencies in the federal government that provide over um, $750 billion annually to state and local governments, to educational institutions, to nonprofit organizations, and in some cases also to public housing authorities, R&D and other types of research labs and businesses. So this is a really wide range of um, entities that are eligible for federal grants and it really depends on the grant. Um, each grant has their own eligibility category that as we'll go into later is, is one of the most important things to look for as you kind of figure out you know, what grants best suit your needs. Uh, just to give you a, a kind of overview of what we're talking about here, um, there are, you know, hundreds of um, federal agencies in as part of the federal government, and they have grant making authorities. So the majority of federal funds are actually coming out of the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Interior, 
um, USDA, which is the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Education. Overall, there's over 1,700 federal grant programs. So we're by no means expecting anyone on this call to memorize and be able to track all of them. And this is exactly what our office is here to do to help you figure out which of these best suit your needs. There are three main types of federal grants. So the first type of federal grant that we see a lot is called formula or pass through grants. These are non competitive awards and they're based on a predetermined formula that's usually actually embedded in the legislation related to the grant. So for example, um, we saw, we see annually highway planning and construction funds that are based on formulas related to population size in a state or the number of highways that a locality has. And localities aren't applying for those funds. They're automatically being sent from the federal government to local entities. Um, another example of this we saw in just last year in the American Rescue Plans K through 12 education funds, where the federal government came up with a formula to decide what the need was per school district, and then automatically sent those funds um, to that school district. The second type of, of grant, which is what we'll be mostly focusing on today, are discretionary or competitive grants. So this is probably what most of you um, think about when you think about grants or grant writing or seeking grants. These are organizations, cases where organizations or entities compete for federal funds through a grant writing process. Um, so for example, we have the Farm to Schools grant program where um, the federal agency puts out a request saying, you know, if you are uh, a local school or a nonprofit and you want to provide urban, educa urban agricultural education or other farm education to your school, you can submit a grant request and we will look at all of them and then pick the ones that we think should receive funding. Um, the last type of federal grant is a congressionally directed or member directed grant. These are very rare compared to the other two types. Um, during certain times in the legislative calendar, for example, appropriation season sometimes, Congress can actually direct funds to be sent, spent on special projects. So for those of you who um, interacted with our office last year, you know about a process called community project funding in which members of Congress could advocate for specific projects to be authorized through legislation. Again, these are very rare and few and far uh, between. And so mostly what we'll be focusing on today are the competitive grants um, and then also a little bit the formula and uh, pass through grants. To give you a sense of how funding actually flows down to the our constituents and, and all of you, the first step is that Congress appropriates funds to grant programs, right? So the congressman um, might, you know, propose a legislation or vote on legislation that actually funds new grant programs or increases or decreases funding for pre-existing grant programs. After that, that um, directive is sent to the federal administering agency, who then awards grants to primary grant recipients. Often, these are actually states, um, in which case the money will be then awarded to different states, who can then award subcontracts or subgrants to local entities or nonprofits. Sometimes, Nonprofits and local entities can apply directly to the government, but we want to make sure to draw your attention to the fact that often this money is flowing through the states, um, which is why it's important to also, you know, be looking at federal funding deadlines and also state application deadlines. So our office can offer a wide range of support for your federal grants, and we hope to work with all of you on this call to do just this. Um, here I've outlined a timeline um, that kind of goes through some of the main key points in the federal grant making process. So some of you might be coming on today because you simply want to understand what is this whole federal grant process. 
Um, some of you might actually have a need in mind and want to apply for something. Um, maybe some are developing a grant, have submitted a grant, or even hopefully some people on this call have been awarded a federal grant. So at each step of this process, our office can offer support. Um, for the first step, you're in the right place. <laughs> Come to our webinars starting with today to learn about how all of this complex process works. And we also offer one-on-one -on -one consultations that our office provides to you to do you know, additional um, explaining and discussion around what, how the needs of your organization or entity match up with what we know about the federal grants process. Um, if you are wanting to apply for a federal grant, we highly recommend that you sign up for our newsletter, which my colleague will post the link to in the chat. Um, this newsletter we send out monthly and it provides a, a list essentially of all of the currently open and forecasted grants related to a host of issues that we know are really important to our community. Um, and from there, you can kind of, you know, figure out what's best for you and get in contact with our office. Once you are developing a grant application, the congressman in, in many circumstances can provide what's called a letter of introduction or a letter of support for your application to the agency. Um, this is a really helpful tool for making sure that your grant is um, kind of reviewed thoroughly and that the agency who might not know the needs of our district can see that the, the representative of that district agrees that this is a necessary and important use of federal funds. So definitely if you're developing a grant application at the federal level, reach out to our office. Um, we can also liaise with the agency that is administering the grant. We've done this several times already, asking clarifying questions about the grant um, and assessing, you know, what is the timeline um, and those types of important pieces of information. Once you've submitted a grant application, um, again, this is another time where our office's ability to be a liaison comes in handy, as well as other forms of advocacy that we're happy to talk about one-on-one, uh, -on -one, you know, as we work together on this. Um, and then, of course, if you're awarded a grant, we'd love to uplift your work. Um, we find it really meaningful to share uh, the, the process from your own eyes to uplift anyone who will be impacted by these funds in our district and to celebrate this amazing achievement um, on our social media through any sort of channel that we can. There are certain ethical limitations on what our office can do related to federal grants. So due to House ethic rules, um, Congressman Bowman and his staff, so and us, we cannot write grants on behalf of district entities. We cannot edit any application materials. We cannot revise any grants. We really can play no part in the actual development of the grant application. As I said previously, we are happy to provide you with an abundance of information about um, you know, what the grant entails, but we can't actually be writing the grant alongside you. We also cannot participate or advocate in any grant related activities that do not have a federal nexus. So that basically means that if you're applying for a grant from a, loca from a local fund, maybe from Westchester County, and those funds did not originate at the federal level, they are simply in the budget at the county level and that's where, they, that's where their lifespan started, then our office cannot be involved in that process. Um, in many cases, funds do originate at the federal level. And so it's still worth reaching out to us and we'll do that analysis and get back to you, but just so that you know. Um, so with that, I'll just say, you know, our office is here to help. Uh, we have a thorough grants website that we really encourage you to visit. We also have an email, bowman.grants at mail.house.gov. Um, I and Kama monitor that inbox. So that's who you'll be seeing behind the scenes. And we absolutely love to hear from you, um, love to do this work. And um, as you can hear from the Congressman really is one of our priorities to make sure that we're empowering as many entities in the district to be seeking out federal funds and advocating as much as we can. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Kama, who's gonna go more into the weeds about what you can expect as you apply for a federal grant. Thank you so much, Ruthie. 
So yeah, Ruthie has introduced you to the types of grants and the work that we can do with you. I'm gonna dig a little more into the competitive grant process and what you need to do to get started. An organization that wins a competitive grant is not finished with the granting agency when they receive the award. There's a life cycle to grants and it's really important to understand each of the phases before you apply. First is the pre-award phase. Here, um, the funding opportunity is announced on the agency's website and on grants.gov, which will be your friend, and applications are reviewed, so or start to be reviewed. Um, when the opportunity is announced, we call that a NOFO, N-O-F-O, which stands for Notice of Funding Opportunity. The pre-award phase also includes the grant writing and the submission, so it includes your part when you're first looking for and writing a grant. Something that you should know about in this pre-award phase is that you can keep an eye out on grants.gov for forecasted opportunities. So grants that are not yet open, but are expected to open soon. That gives you a heads up that this program will be announced and you can prepare for it, which is nice to have that little bit of extra time. But note that not all agencies appear to list forecasted. Sometimes an announcement just goes in as soon as it opens. When they do list it, the length of time a NOFO is open can vary, but it seems to usually be around two months. So also know that after the deadline, um, agencies review and can take a long time to announce awards. So the whole process really can be quite long. This, elite, this leads us to the award phase. Once you find an open opportunity and write the grant application, you'll submit it through grants.gov. You'll receive notification that it's been turned in right away, and then initial review begins. There are four parts to this phase. First, the initial screening that ensures that your application is complete and that you're actually eligible. If your grant passes that stage, it moves on to the agency that's awarding the grant. There, they do a programmatic review. So they look at your actual grant proposal and the program that you want to, the project you wanna do, uh, and they'll assess the content of the application. They will also do a financial review of proposed budgets. Um, this, uh, this part also uh, it includes the award decision and the announcement when they get ready to make it. Once the final award decisions are made, the awarding agency sends out an NOA, another acronym, a notice of award to the entities that are selected for funding. Then the, this notice of award is the official legal binding issuance of the award you need to be aware that when you or your organization accepts the grant, for example, by signing the, agreement, the grant agreement or by drawing down funds, you become legally obligated to carry out the full terms and conditions of the grant. Um, so be careful. I'm sure you will, though. Um, then the, in the grant administration phase, this is where you carry out your project. So after an apl applicant receives a notice of award and the funds have been dispersed, grantees get to begin their projects. And of course, that's the fun and important part. The not quite as fun part of this is that you're now responsible for meeting the administrative, the financial, and the programmatic reporting requirements. Um, so there, and that differs for each grant or each agency. It's so important to remember that you really must meet the reporting requirements. So you wanna keep careful records of your programming and the budgeting. And if you're required to demonstrate how effective your project was, you'll also need to collect data along the way. But that would have been part of the grant proposal and the, the full grant announcement. So you'll, you should know that already when you apply for the grant. And finally is the post-award phase. Uh, this is when your project period or grant period has come to an end, but it really isn't over. Now it's time to follow through with requirements on reporting. So you'll likely already have been reporting during the grant administration phase on budget and programming, but you're probably going to need to file a final report on the project. And as I mentioned before, you may need data to support your claims on that. Um, again, that, would, that should all be apparent in the grant application. So if you've read it carefully, that won't come as a surprise. Next slide. 
I really don't want to scare you away, but before you apply, you have to register on multiple federal sites, which can sorely try your patience. So you should allow for a month to get all of the registration pieces together. Um, hopefully it really won't take that long, but it could. So just be aware that you need to plan well ahead. So first thing you'll need to do is register as an entity that will be seeking federal funding. This is really an ordeal. So make sure you allow time and you're in a patient mood or be okay with stretching it out over more than one day, which you can do. You save your work as you register. If you've applied for federal funding in the past, this has already been done. And so there's only, probably only a little bit that you'll have to do. If you haven't, you're gonna wanna go to sam.gov and you'll read the instructions well ahead of time. I promise you, you'll be glad you did. Your organization needs a lot of paperwork, you or you if you're in charge of it. Um, and to start with, you need what's called a unique entity identifier or UEI. Up until now, basically, this has been called a DUNS number, which, is, which stands for Data Universal Numbering System. And that has been issued by Dunn and Bradstreet. But that's um, starting April 4th, SAM.gov is changing this and they're gonna issue the unique entity identifier themselves and it will be called a UEI SAM. So you're gonna get a different number directly from SAM. Hopefully that means you won't have to wait as long to get your UEI. Um, if you have already applied and you have a DUNS number, um, I mean, if you have applied in the past or registered in the past and you have a DUNS number, you are going to need to change that with SAM after April 4th. Okay, so once you have that unique identifier, you'll need to gather paperwork. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I'm wrong, but that's okay. No, stay there. Sorry. You'll need to gather paperwork, and this is outlined on SAM.gov and includes legal and financial business information. Once you've done that, you'll receive codes and you can register at login.gov for an account that will allow you to access um, a whole bunch of different federal programs and sites. Again, SAM.gov does have clear directions, so be sure to look them over before you're ready to register so you know what you'll need. And be aware that, um, this is my personal opinion, but in some ways, SAM.gov isn't always user-friendly and you may have to search around a bit, but it really is worth it. They do have a lot of resources on the site. So just bring your patients with you. Okay, so um, I have a screenshot here on the right just to show you that SAM.gov has lists of what you're going to need. I won't go through each of these, but I did want to just cover a little bit, which is that you will need legal and financial documents for the organization, and you'll need some codes. For now, um, just in case, you should go ahead and get a NAICS code, that's the N-A-I-C-S, and an S-I-C code. You might not need them, but then again, you might, depending on the requirements of the agency and your type of organization. Um, these, oh, what those are is codes that identify the type of work your organization does. They are not unique numbers. You've already got your UEI, but the NAICS and the SIC uh, just are, you self choose those, you self select what type of work your organization does. And if there's more than one type of work that you do, there's more than one category, it's perfectly fine to use multiple codes. Um, okay, so now you have logged in to login.gov and registered there. Their, their website says, I'm not, can you go back, Ruthie? Thanks. Um, their website says that it, you should allow about 11 days for registration to be active in all websites. Um, so that's part of that month that I mentioned earlier. Once your record becomes active, you're gonna be assigned yet another code called a CAGE code. Just take note of it. Some, some entities don't need to use it and some do. Okay, after you've, read, just, you've received approval, you're just about ready to go. You can now register on grants.gov to apply for grants. Next slide, thanks, perfect. Um, this, this'll go much faster. And I wanna note that it is not necessary to register to use grants.gov to search for grants. So you can go ahead and be searching for grants anytime. You don't have to log in. 
Um, okay. So get ready to search. This is what I find fun. Um, there are so many, so many opportunities out there though, and most of them are not going to fit your needs. So you're gonna to wanna to narrow the search. And I've got a screenshot here of what your search site, of the search page will look like on grants.gov. And then the left side, um, the left side of the website, I've actually got on the right side of the slide, that's where you can narrow things down. Um, and I, I definitely recommend doing that. You can, re you can um, restrict by your eligibility, for example. You can restrict by whether the um, announcement has been posted or forecasted. You might even know about something. Let's say you do a search for a particular type of grant. It doesn't show up, but you know that it's an annual grant. You can also search through the closed grant opportunities to see what it was last time, and that can help you prepare. You might uh, restrict by your eligibility. If you're a municipality or you are a um, nonprofit, you can select just no photo, just opportunities that fit uh, include your type of organization. You can also restrict by agency, and that's a smart thing to do because after a while, you'll get a feel for which agencies do the kinds of grants that you're interested in. For example, Department of State does entirely um, international grants for other countries. And so if you're a local entity, you're not gonna wanna do that uh, you, and you can leave them out. Okay, next slide. What should you look for? You're searching and you find a, a NOFO or an opportunity that you think might be a fit for your program. What's next? Next. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so here you go. You click on, you've got a search with a whole bunch of um, NOFOs listed. You click on one of them and this pops up and it pops up, that particular grant pops up. Notice I've got a red circle around a tab and you may not be able to read it, but it says related documents. Very, very important because the, pay, the first page you look at is gonna be a synopsis of the grant. But if you are seriously interested in that opportunity, you need to read the full description to get detailed account of what you're gonna need. So you'll click on the um, related documents tab, although sometimes the related documents are actually linked low, lower down in the synopsis. Once you're there, you wanna look at um, the full announcement. Eligibility is super, super important. Look at the granting agency and make sure that their goals match your goals. Look at the timing. The federal government will not accept a, a grant proposal that is one minute late. If, you, if something goofs, something happens with your internet, so sad, too bad. Um, so you have to be careful to notice when the time, when it closes. Uh, eligibility I mentioned is so important. Please make sure that you're eligible. And there, sometimes there are requirements that will trip you up. Like you must have a certain type of collaborator. Check very carefully. Um, the description and the goals and the synopsis are nice for a quick decision on whether you think it'll fit. But again, if, it, if you think it fits, you need to go to the entire full description under related documents. Another important piece is cost share. This is where um, your organization may be required to find non-federal funding to support your project, not just the federal. This is sometimes called matching funds and sometimes called cost share. If it's required, the full announcement will have details and the synopsis will just say yes or no. Um, hopefully, it, if it says no, that means that the, the grant can fund the entire project that you're proposing. Um, and then application requirements are another important piece. You want to pay close attention and go through the whole list of what's required before submitting an application because supporting documents may be required. For example, if you have collaborators, there will be documents that are required from them as well. So super important to know this from the outset so that you don't get tripped up um, and lose the grant just because you forgot to attach one document. Next slide. So we've got here um, a list of helpful resources. 
are, I'm just going to, I'm not going to go through each one, but we've linked um, to almost all of them. There's a link there, which I think we're going to be making available to you. I know we are. And, uh, but I did want to mention, um, Ruthie had already mentioned Congressman Bowman's grant webpage. We do have a lot of other resources listed there. So please visit that one. Um, also, Congressional Research Service is an amazing, amazing organization um, connected with the Library of Congress and with, and with us, Congress. They produce reports that are very helpful, and we've listed two of them here. Um, one is a document called Resources for Grant Seekers, and the other is on writing a grant proposal, so very helpful. Grants.gov is the last one that I'll talk about. And I just wanna briefly say they have a ton of resources because they want you to get grants. So do explore grants.gov as well for tips. Okay, now I'm gonna turn the mic over to Jan Fisher, who is the Executive Director of Nonprofit Westchester. And she'll be giving you some personal insight into the world of grant seeking from the perspective of nonprofits. Thank you so much. And thank you to Congressman Bowman. Um, I've been doing this a long time and he certainly um, expends a lot of energy and resources to, to serve his community in this and, and other areas. So I'm really honored to be here. Some of what I say is going to be repetitive of what my colleagues have said, but the ultimate goal is to get approved. Um, and I'm just going to share some insights I have written many, many grants and I have met, written um, many federal grants. And I have to say what Kama has said is really be prepared, get prepared, um, under, go to grants.gov, um, deal with the potential trauma of, of getting signed up. Um, it, it is frustrating. It is a lot of work, but it is really, really worth it to do. Um, so next slide, please. Um, the decision-making process. I can't stress enough that it, it's really important as this says, do not try to fit a square peg into a round hole. There are always other grants, but if you do decide to apply for a grant, the, the macro level thing that is important is clearly define with your team the need and the problem that you are trying to address and your solution. And really, as Kama said, review the grant thoroughly because there, you don't want there to be any surprises when you're halfway through that grant process and you haven't read enough of the material and something happens and you realize you're not eligible or you don't have the right system set up or the right partnerships. So reviewing the particular grant is really, really important. Um, another thing is a cost analysis. So Kama spoke about the cost sharing or you know, whether um, there were going to be other funds necessary. But even with that, organizations have to do a cost analysis whether, you know, it, it sounds wonderful to get a $5 million grant, let's say to provide mental health services, but you really have to analyze whether that grant is going to cover the full, um, the full amount of the service that you're providing. Not all grants at any level, county, state, or even federal do cover the full cost of service. Federal grants tend to cover the cost of service more than other um, government entities. But those are really, really important um, tips. Okay, next slide, please. Don't go it alone. Um, I can't stress enough again, um, collaboration and partnerships are really important in the grant process. I would say in any case, um, the reviewers that are reviewing your grant are going to absolutely look for partnerships, look for collaboration, look to see that there's some level of skin in the game, not only from you, but from other partners. There's been a lot of value lately in public-private partnerships with um, nonprofits, businesses, 
and other entities working together. It makes your work stronger. And I think that's why um, government and other entities, even foundations, are looking really um, much more kindly on the level of collaboration um, that is in your grant. The other thing is when you may start speaking, um, let's say you're a nonprofit and you wanna collaborate with other nonprofits, um, it may get to the point where even if you've come in and said, you wanna be the lead in this grant, don't get hung up on that. Make the grant happen, provide that service, support your community in the best way possible even if it means that you have to hand over the lead to another organization that might be in a better financial position, just might be in a better position overall. Being the lead is often not always what it's cracked up to be. Um, managing a federal grant can strain your own um, infrastructure in your organization, your finance team, your program team. So make decisions um, without big ego involved, make decisions based on what the community need is and, and how best um, to meet that. Next slide. This is a great example um, of an organization, um, the STEM Alliance that identified, clearly identified a need. Um, the digital divide. Uh, we know from during COVID and now that having digital access is essential um, to get things done, to work, to go to school, to do so many things. And they identified a problem. Um, they identified why it's a really critical, important problem. And they identified a solution. And their solution included working with other agencies. So you will see their programming is actually quite simple, what they offer, but they have a network of collaborators and they have won federal, state, county, any type of grant you can imagine. I think this organization has been able to secure because they engage others. They've engaged the business community, the legal community, and other nonprofits in their work. So really think about how collabor collaboration can strengthen your work and can also strengthen the impact of what you're trying to do for your community and the people you serve. So next slide. So a number of, you know, in developing your grant, grant writers, um, clearly, I would recommend um, if your agency has the resources um, that you hire somebody that has a lot of experience in federal grants. Federal grants are a different type of animal altogether than other grants. You don't need one, but it's always better to have one. And I've had conversations um, with the Congressman staff. There are a lot of racial and other equity issues involved with what organizations have the financial resources to afford a grant writer. We are all aware of this and hopefully down the line, um, there will be some systems and opportunities in place for those organizations um, that have been systemically left out. But for now, um, I do think if you take note of the resources and really use them, um, the Congressman's office, the other offices, the other um, resources offered um, through the federal government, you can develop this grant on your own. Um, a few tips. I have written grants um, for very big projects with very little support. They've never gotten funded. Um, you need to engage your full staff in the grant writing process. If you're a large organization and have a finance team, an HR team, um, a program team, they need to be a part of this. If you're a smaller organization, you do need to bring in your staff as a sounding board um, because you can't possibly cover everything. A lot of the federal opportunities offer training sessions. Um, I've often attended the same training session because you hear different things at different sessions. Um, again, read the, the um, frequently asked questions because they, there you will find questions that you may never have thought of. 
that other agencies have thought of. Um, in developing the grant, answer the questions directly and simply. It is the reviewers, as I say, two um, items down, they're not looking for pros. They're looking for you to answer the questions. The, the closer you stay to answering the questions, rather than trying to brag about your organization or bringing in other ancillary things, um, I think will weaken your grant. Um, be realistic and don't overpromise. As Kama said, you're going to be asked for data to support the claims that you make in your grant. So if you say, because you think it sounds good, that we're going to serve a hundred people and you know that you really are going only to serve 50, you're gonna be caught um, in that. And when you're even at the first sta stage, when your grant is being reviewed and decisions are made, the grant reviewers know what they're doing. They're going to know if something sounds like an exaggeration. Um, I recommend that if it sounds low, if the number sounds low to you, explain the impact, talk about your impact, talk about what the grant is going to achieve, and don't be as hung up on numbers unless the grant asks um, for certain numbers. Again, reviewers are not looking for pros and recognize exaggeration. Um, we are all very pressed for time, and often uh, we will cut and paste from one grant to another. I seriously advise against that because you become complacent in answering questions. When you cut from one grant to another, you really risk not answering the question in the way it's being asked. So those are some tips. Um, next slide. And um, as Kama alluded to or, or said very clearly, there are um, a lot of resources um, on grants.gov. Um, here are some that I've um, come up with, provided links to. Um, once you get into any of these um, particular links, they will take you to other links and you will have a whole um, library of ways um, to support um, your grants. And um, proofreading, that was the last thing that I put down there. In developing a proposal, you really have to leave time to proofread it. And if you have a colleague or you know, someone that you trust, um, have somebody outside your organization read the grant as well. And that's what I have for now. Great, thank you so much for that um, immense amount of detail and tips. I think those are super helpful and things that I hadn't heard before. So thank you for sharing all that. Um, we're now going to move into the Q&A portion of the webinar. And so I, we have about you know, 15 minutes left for questions. So definitely go ahead and type your questions in the chat or in the Q&A box, and we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. Um, I see first just a couple here. The first I can just quickly answer, um, how can we access the links? We will send around uh, the slide deck and a link to the recording and a email with all of the links embedded in it afterwards um, for anyone who registered for the webinar. So if you're on but didn't actually register, please go ahead and do so afterwards so that we can make sure to capture your email. Um, we have a question about, um, other sources of funds. Somebody says, I see that this is about federal funds. What are other sources of funds that I should also know about? Um, I can start off by reiterating that yeah, as a congressional office, we are focused mostly on federal funds, but that many of those funds um, actually pass through to the state and to the local level before reaching other smaller towns, villages, or nonprofits or businesses. And so definitely we encourage you to also make contact with you know, your state representative, local representatives um, to understand what are other funds there available. Um, and then Jan, I'll pass it to you if you have other ideas. Yeah, I, you know, there are st statistics out there um, about funding. I, I, government funding and government reimbursement are two different things. So many organizations, you'll see 80% of their funding comes from government, 
but some of that might be Medicaid, some of that might be grants. Um, I think government is the first place to go um, to look for funding. Um, a statistic, 3% of um, funding for nonprofits nationwide is from businesses and corporations. So nonprofits spend a lot of time and energy trying to get businesses to support their nonprofits. I would focus on government and foundation personally. That's what I found, especially here in Westchester. Um, we have a wonderful um, corporate and business sector, but they are 3% of funding um, nationwide. Government is our partner. Um, we provide mandated services. So I would start there. Here in Westchester again, we have really wonderful foundations. Um, the Westchester Community Foundation, um, there is a, and I'm forgetting the name, but there is a foundation that specifically works in the Mount Vernon, Bronx, Pelham, New Rochelle area. Um, I, United Way, I would, I would look local first um, if you're going foundation. Um, and again, government, government, government. And there is currently a nonprofit grant program out there from the county government. I encourage everyone to go to um, the Westchester County website, um, the Business First Grant Opportunity. Um, it's on for about another three weeks and we are providing the technical support for that. So that's something that's happening now that's really important. It's in five, um, thousand dollar increments to forty five thousand dollars to um, to address economic hardship on nonprofits related to COVID and also to religious institutions and that is ARPA funds. So I feel comfortable talking about it here because it does come down um, through the federal government from the state, I think, to the county. Um, but please go on the Business First County website and look at that opportunity and contact me if you wanna know any more about that. That's great, thank you so much. That actually is a perfect segue to our next question, which is what are some tips for how to determine if a county grant may have originated from federal funding? So I'm really glad that um, you raised this question because as we said, that is what the main way in which our office can get involved. Um, one of the things that we always start with is simply Googling, you know, checking out the name of the grant um, alongside and use the word federal and see what comes up. Often you'll end up on a federal agency website about that grant, which is how you know that it has originated in federal funds. One example of this is the CDBG fund, Community Development Block Grant Fund, that a lot of localities and nonprofits tap into in New York 16. This grant um, happens at the county or city level, depending on where you live, but actually does originate at the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. So our office can you know, participate in activities related to that grant. Um, Kema, Jan, did you any either of you want to add to that? Uh, I no, but I, I'm just looking up now the um, link to the county's business first grant, and I'm going to put that in the chat because I think that's a really um, the county really wants to award these funds to nonprofits and religious institutions as well. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put that in the chat as well if that's okay. Right. Um, I don't really have anything to add. I think Ruthie covered it really well. And I think you mentioned, Ruthie, that um, we can help with that too, finding that, figuring out whether there's a federal nexus, going back to Noel's original question. Yes, absolutely. The answer to all of these questions is oh, don't hesitate to reach out to our office, bowman.grants at mail.house.gov. Um, great. We have another question which is if our nonprofit is run primarily by volunteers, only one full-time staff member, is it possible to receive a federal grant? Um, yes, absolutely. I, and I think, I mean, I will defer to Jan because she's received more than I have, but there's no reason you shouldn't be able to apply. It does make it 
um, more challenging because you're probably a small nonprofit, um, but you absolutely can still apply. Is that, am I right, Jan? Yeah, you can apply. I think in the evaluation process, you know, they might not feel that you have the capacity to implement the grant. So again, this is where I would encourage a nonprofit to say, are there other partners? Are we going to be able to achieve what we want to by ourselves? Um, and oftentimes for a smaller nonprofit, it might make sense to go to a larger nonprofit and seek out some type of collaboration to actually make the program happen. I would worry that in the when they're um, checking organizational capacity, which is usually a question, you know, how you how your organization is going to be judged to deliver the services, that would be um, where you do not score well. So you should definitely seek um, other opportunities within your community and with other partners. Great, thank you. Our next question is um, related to um, how long it takes to apply for a federal grant. So Kim, I know that you, uh, both of you really already touched on this, but if you wanna just reiterate, you know, what is your best sense for how long of a time frame people should leave to apply for a federal grant? I think Jan's gonna do a better job with this one than I am. I just know months. It, it, it really, for me, it depends on which agency is issuing the grant. So you have um, SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. I think that those grants are the easiest to do. Um, and I think others are, are much more complex um, than they are. But, you know, the day that you get the notification is the day you should start um, preparing for that grant, creating a timeline. I think another tip that I didn't put in as, as, as I'm hearkening back is I think it's really important to create a timeline for a federal grant and to assign responsibilities to bring people to the table, whether it be virtual or otherwise, and to know who is responsible for what, who is writing which part, who's developing the budget, who's gathering all the documents. Oftentimes you will need memorandums of understanding or subcontractor agreements. Make assignments and hold people accountable with a date. And that way you will be able to determine your timeline um, for that grant. But I would start on day one with a meeting of all the people that you need in your organization and with your partners to get things done. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'll just, we have time for one more question. If anybody would like to put anything else in the chat, um, I'll just take this opportunity to again, reiterate that, you know, our office is here to help. We have already had great success in helping secure federal grants for localities and nonprofits, um, including in the um, space of violence prevention, of transportation improvements, um, flood mitigation. But we also do know that in many cases, you know, these smaller organizations or smaller localities are at a disadvantage, as Jan mentioned, when it comes to accessing grant funding because of those capacity issues or because of those systemic issues of being historically ignored and excluded from the federal grant making process. That is one of the main um, things driving the congressman's motivation and our office's grants work here. And so regardless of the size of the organization or the size of the neighborhood or the number of people that you serve, um, our office really wants to connect around federal grants and do all that we can to make sure that um, that you have access to the information that is available. Um, I, I wanna, can I add something? I think somebody made a really, really important point. Um, Karen I, I, Tumelti, um, I'm sorry if I butchered your name, but if you apply and get declined, you should absolutely ask for feedback from that agency and they will give it because the next time you apply, you can rectify um, 
based on that feedback. And I think that's really, really um, important to do. Thank you. And our last question, Jen, I'll send back to you, which is um, how do you find a grant writer, mentor, or coach? Do you have any recommendations there? Um, Nonprofit Westchester will not recommend um, grant writers. Um, we So there is grant professionals of the Lower Hudson. I don't think their specialty is federal grants. Um, there are organizations um, out there that have used grant writers. What I can do, um, federal grant writers, I would absolutely, you need to interview more than one grant writer. Um, even if you think you've found the person that is amazing for you or the organization that's amazing for you, interview them, make sure that they that, that you feel comfortable with them. But I think what I would like to do is go back to some of our member organizations and ask them, um, maybe get a list of, you know, five federal grant um, writers and, and um, get them back to you for you to share without an endorsement, just based on what other organizations have said. Thank you. And one of the resources that Kama put in her slides was, um, you know, grant writing tips and from the Congressional Research Service. So we definitely also recommend that you look through that and see if there is more information about um, how to find, you know, support in that arena. Um, and with that, we're almost at time. We have just a, a closing poll that we wanted to give all of you. This is the first grants related webinar that our office has done this year. And we wanna make sure that future webinars are um, best suited to all of the needs that you all wanna explore more. So we came up with three options for a potential follow-up webinar. And if you have a moment, um, please do uh, click on your favorite option and so that we can start working on our next series. Um, it seems so far like all three options, so maybe we have three grants webinars in our future. Um, thank you all tremendously for the work that you do locally in our district. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for bringing such great questions and such helpful information. Um, thank you to Jan, of course, for joining our office. Um, and as always, we're here to help bowman.grants at mail.house.gov. We look forward to many follow-up questions with you all. Um, great. With that, uh, we'll close. So have a great evening, everyone.